So Marissa and I just pulled out in the pasture and we discovered something new hiding away from the rest of the herd. And we're giving the Big Joe herd one of their favorite things today. Hey guys, welcome back to Cross Timbers Bison. We've got the whole fam with us. We got Bullet, we got Marissa, we've got Jackie, we've got Yearlings. I don't know where currently the Big Joe herd is. They must be over here on the hill. I wanna thank Redmond for sponsoring today's video. We just pulled up to one of our mineral feeders here. This is something, uh, it's got little skids on it. We can pull it with the ATV. It is currently empty and what we put in here it's a wonderful time of the year right as we're transitioning from summer into fall seasons are changing temperatures are changing but one of the favorite things that we like to put out is our bison 90. so before we go out and find the big joe hurt and check out our new baby we're going to put out some of our favorite product bison 90 from redmond this is our 50 pound bag of bison 90 selenium this is what we carry year round for our bison redmond has come up with something awesome a little more convenient for you guys redmond came out with a 25 pound bag of bison 90. redmond offers a variety of trace minerals and even in block form for your livestock program you can have this conveniently shipped right to your home it's honestly kind of convenient right now that the bison aren't up here is that they typically see us or hear us first they won't let us pour this redmond out it gets a little sketchy sometimes so we're just going to spread it out here the most important thing about products like the bison 90 here is if your animals like it there's lots of mineral blocks out there and there's different trace minerals but if your animals don't like it and don't consume it there's no point in buying it use a test bag just like this 25 pound bag and see if they really like it see if they actually consume it it may take them a little bit to get used to it we keep bison 90 out year round and our animals love it they go through stages where they want more and then sometimes they don't want very much at all but it's always available to them and you can get it in trace form just like this right here or you can get it in a mineral block form as well all from redmond this is a full spectrum of c minerals marissa and i actually got to go to this salt mine out in southern utah last year and we absolutely loved it we got to see exactly where this product come from there's no synthetic chemical processing naturally simple good stuff for your animals so if you want to try something new and you're not wanting to order a whole bunch of bulk product you can order the 25 pound bag off of redmondagriculture.com use the promo code dumbbar you can have the 25 pound bag ship to you or your ranch wherever you want it to go and you can test out the bison 90 or any other product you're interested in for your livestock and if you like it you can contact redmond and then you can get as much as you want just like on the great plains we let bison be bison and if they want it they can have it as they're grazing or just going to get some water if they want to grab some minerals they grab some minerals
All right, we gotta go see where the herd is. So Marissa and I just pulled out here and here is the most recent born baby, the new red dog from the 1508 mama. Cute old guy. Hey peaches. And we're looking around all of a sudden, a little bit further away in the pasture, underneath one of the pecan trees is a new baby. We've got a new late bloomer red dog out here in the pasture. Let's go look a little bit closer and see who this mom is. A hoss? Yeah. Hoss and Dunbar. Hoss and Dunbar. So this is a hoss or a Dunbar baby. Mm-hmm. Is it a female or a male? That's hard to tell. All right, so this is the 1503 mama. So that is two South Dakota mamas, first timers ever having a red dog. And complete surprise on both of these, born about a week apart. This is crazy. Oh, this is a healthy looking calf. This one's much fluffier than the other one, Marissa. Big Joe. Who's he following? That would be. Uh, that would be. I got wet, busted. So, did have a feeder, but it broke, and um, it's right here. So I've been putting it on the ground. They've been pretty busy at it, loving it, because it's so dry this time of the year. So there's a big project that we've been talking about doing. It has to do with our creek, in case you guys didn't know. There's a creek that runs through the Ponderosa. We talked about how to utilize it um, because it runs pretty much year round. And we've talked about how to use it for our bison um, because we tried to drill two water wells last summer. Not successful on either one of them. You know, around here, you typically don't do windmills. It's not very, it's kind of old school. There's nothing wrong with it, but windmills is not a thing anymore uh, in this area so we've uh, talked about how do we use this creek because our bison this is in the burn unit by the way it's an 80 acres we burnt in October of 2021 we're gonna burn it again this spring by the way 2025 spring but this awesome creek that Brooks loves to come down to and we bring her and let her play in it like I said it runs year-round but Besides just letting the bison in here to drink directly from it, 
have thought of different ways of trying to use it. So you guys let us know if you have ideas of pumping water out of it, you know, in some of these little bathtubs like this or wherever it's flowing very fast. This is about as fast as it flows. It's not super fast at all. Besides the bison having access to this water is like here is the ATV. Here's our path that we drive down. You can see here there is a sandstone rock bed that's pretty much in the most of this creek. But here when you come down it kind of drops off into this silt, right? And then there is a very quick, steady incline. And it's hard for you to see on camera, on film. So, but there is. And then our trucks, I've made the mistake of this once or twice when we first got the Ponderosa, is it rubs the bottom of the truck. And it's just not safe. Uh, there's the potential of getting stuck here um, because of the silt and everything. Marissa and I have been talking and thinking about putting a slab across here on this creek and so here's the here's kind of the thing on this is you got to sort of you've got to protect your riparian zones and I didn't really know what a riparian zone was until about a year ago or so um, after joining some local organizations that are to help better the land essentially when I joined those I learned what a riparian zone was basically your creek sort of tributaries uh, protecting those and what happens is off these banks and stuff if you have a lot of traffic uh, your animals can trample those banks down so bad like these are pretty good right there's grass growing on them and in some cases you have a lot of hoof traffic where there's no grass and so you're losing soil um, along your waterways as such as a creek and when it gets up in those big heavy floods you're going to lose some. That's just the way it goes uh, on a big, heavy, rushing flood, which has happened here a couple times. The last big one we got was the tornado. So if you, if you keep your animals off the banks, you can lower the erosion rate. You can lower that erosion of your soil and losing it. And so um, what we've talked about is building a pad here, one that we can drive across. On the ATV, it doesn't have a problem right now. But you can drive a vehicle across it and a, maybe a tractor um, safely to get from the burn unit to the and the back of the property to um, to the front of the property. Because right now you can't drive a vehicle through this area. We want some kind of guidance here. Thought about doing a slab and kind of making it sort of even with the rock bed that we have here, and then possibly do you put a culvert underneath it? Do you put a tin horn underneath it um, and make the water go under it? Or do you do not do a tin horn? Hey girl, hey Jackie. Do you not do a tin horn? Do you not do piping underneath it and just let the water rush over the slab? Um, kind of like um, my sister and brother-in-law's place, <clears throat> Arms Family Homestead, their slab on their creek, the water just runs over it. He doesn't have a culvert going underneath that slab so need some ideas and stuff on this um, which way to do it and then the, the the other thing is how do you divert the water so you can pour a concrete slab i have no idea we have no idea do you have to build another outlet for the creek a diversion a detour for the water to pour your concrete here to put it in your forms to make your concrete slab we got all these things to think about because this is a project that we're wanting to do. So number one, you can cross it. And then two, instead of the animals coming down on the creek bed, right, in these areas here, instead of them coming down on some of these places where it could erode, they can actually come and drink on the actual concrete pad itself as well. So those are, those are kind of the two keys on this. And while we're doing this, safely cross and then a place where the bison can come and drink from a hard platform and get fresh water. So we want it to keep running, of course. We're not trying to slow it down necessarily or change it, um, the flow of it. But those are things that I don't know a whole lot about. So we're going to see what you guys think. So kind of a fun fact on this creek, actually, this watershed that we're a part of, even though Arbuckle Lake 
is like literally five minutes down the road. This water is actually part of the Lake Texoma watershed. And if you don't know where Lake Texoma is, it's basically where the Red River runs into it at Texas and Oklahoma. It's kind of sort of the south center of our state. It's the second largest lake in the state of Oklahoma. This water doesn't go to our lake, Lake Arbuckle. It goes to the Washita River, and the Washita River actually leads to Lake Texoma. So there you go. Kind of an interesting fun fact. It's all how the land lays. Marissa and I were heading back to the barn. I want to show you guys something. This is uh, what we call our halfway acres, nine acres. Here's a pond we just caught some turtles out of here recently. Oh, speaking of turtles, I did want to let you guys know nobody actually guessed it. So um, here recently we posted a video on uh, a guy that was trapping turtles in the area and he asked if he could come trap some turtles out of our pond. And he trapped several turtles out of our pond, including this one right here in our nine acres. See the bison are up here, the big Joe Herd is. And uh, I asked everybody to give a guess on how big that huge common snapping turtle was. Well, guys, it was 22 pounds. That was the second largest one he had ever caught. His largest was 25. I don't think anybody guessed it right, but to uh, let you guys know, 22 pound common snapping turtle. A lot of interesting uh, turtle news, something different, but also part of the Ponderosa. And part of that removal was to help us get a fish population back in these ponds that have taken a, essentially a beating uh, from the recent droughts and the dry weather. So they've been going dry, and when they go dry, the predation levels go way up, uh, which means uh, they're getting eaten, basically, and they can't thrive. So we've got a lot of pond work to do around here. Still got a lot of projects on our mind to improve our ponds so we can uh, do, our, do our fish thing. We want to ha have ponds so brooks can be able to fish and whatnot. But what I wanted to show you as I'm stopping by here in the Southway Acres is take a look at this. So um, right here, all this behind me, is uh, kind of like evidence that we're doing some things right, right? There's some things that you just, uh, even bullet lacks. He said there's a nice spot to lay down here. Um, it makes you feel a little bit better when you pull in pastures like this. So this is Indian grass and it has came to seed. And I'll, so this was grazed two or three times this year. Um, once in the early spring, once in maybe kind of late summer essentially hey jackie it had been hit a couple of times plus those cows that uh the neighbors cows this is the place that they showed up on and uh anyway so it had been grazed a little bit but not overgrazed. so it was basically a high intense grazing on a short amount of time that's at least with our bison that we did that with so that's called adaptive grazing okay i see you i see you but the most important part is that we gave it rest and we gave it time so it came to seed. So all this stuff behind me that you see, not the big white dog, but everything that you see here is all Indian grass. And there's patches of it out throughout this pasture. And it's uh, some of it's as tall as my chest, which is awesome to see. This Indian grass, which seeds out this time of the year, kind of a late summer, um, can get really tall. So, so what happens when they seed out? All these seeds will go down into the bank here and it's protected by all this biomass of grass here, which is still laying on the turf. All these seeds will go into storage and hopefully will come back next year. And so our regenerative work that we're putting into this place and trying to get everything going, get the native grasses growing and reproducing a whole lot more um, without any chemical influence. Basically prescribed burning and management on grazing and those are the things that we've done and we've seen a lot more of native grasses especially on acres like this now our sacrifice pastures which are over here they need a little bit of work which is why we're going to plant a cover crop um, here in about a week or so evidence like this makes you feel a little bit better that some things are going the right way on your property Eleanor. 
Hey girl, what you doing? Tubby belly. So if you didn't know, most of these females come in heat in July, August, and uh, maybe a little bit into September. Breeding season has pretty much come to a close here. I see a little bit of action from Big Joe today, but this is the question, and I'll ask you this. A lot of bison producers pull their bulls out right now, or they have already done it basically at the beginning of September. Some places don't. You can do this with cattle as well, horses, sheep, goats, any domestic animal, you can pull out those potential sires and kind of control your breeding season. Now, bison are like deer, turkeys. They only come in heat once a year. Bison typically only come in heat at the same time year round. They're a, like a wild animal, a wild deer, turkey, anything like that. They come in heat in July and August and kind of in September. So, if you pull the bulls out in September, you now are kind of controlling when those mamas are gonna have those babies. Naturally, bison do that anyways. They're having babies in May. You don't want them to have babies in late June or July, and especially August, right? When it's miserably hot and typically dry here. It can be harder on the moms. So we let bison be bison, but we can kind of manage it a little bit by taking the bulls out and we reduce the risk of having those late babies like these two mamas, the 1508 and the 1503 mama, who just had those babies coming in heat late. Now, the only bad part, and this goes with any domestic animal, the only bad part is if you take those bulls out or you take those potential sires out, you could potentially miss out on having a calf. So, therefore, you're out that year. So next year, if we take some out and they didn't come in heat and they didn't cycle, which naturally they should, then you miss out on a calf. You guys let us know what you think. We thought about pulling Big Joe and our new bull here, a 22 bull from Idaho up to the barn. And our young bull still has to grow. So we're probably gonna have to feed him some over the winter. I'm sure Big Joe would love a little extra attention on feed. <laughs> I bet he would love it. So you guys let us know what you think. I wanna thank Redmond for sponsoring us today too as well. They have some great products, not only for our bison that love their products, which is the most important thing, but they have a lot of pretty good food stuff too, guys. Marissa's favorite steak seasoning, the Wasatch steak seasoning, you can all get from redmondagriculture.com. Check it out, guys. Don't forget to use code right here. Don't forget to use that dumb bar at redmondagriculture.com. Link is down in the description. Check out all their awesome products. We love their cooking stuff, their household stuff, food grade stuff. And of course, the Bison 90 that we use for those guys right there. Keep them healthy and keep that immunity going all year round. See you guys soon. Keep on Bison ranching.